Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Culture Chats at Lunch. My name is Nicole Adams and I'm the Genealogy and Local History Librarian for the Oshawa Public Libraries. It's a pleasure to meet you all through Zoom. Um, I know this is a format that we've all been using a lot lately, so we've become quite accustomed to it. Um, it be interesting once we are able to do in-person programming again, just to see people in person will be a wonderful thing. Um, I'm delighted to be presenting as part of this series today, which is a collaboration between the Ontario Regiment RCAC Museum, Osho Museum, Parkwood Estate, the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, and of course, Osho Public Libraries, of which um, I'm a part. Oshawa's galleries, libraries, archives, and museums have been actively engaging the community throughout the pandemic, virtually, and this series is an opportunity to share stories with both faithful and new audiences through fun, accessible talks and programs intended to support connection and well-being. Organizations all located in the city of, as, as organizations all located in the city of Oshawa, we collectively understand and appreciate the importance of positioning ourselves on this land. You may be joining us from elsewhere, and I encourage you to visit native-land.ca to understand the indigenous history and languages of where you live. Oshawa is located on treaty land of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island Nation and the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Anishinaabe. Today, our indigenous communities continue to, to contribute to the life of this city and to celebrate their heritage, practice traditions, and care for the land and waterways as sacred. Today, I'll be talking about DNA testing as it relates to ancestry. You may have already tested or have heard of people who've tested and you're not quite sure what to make of the results, or maybe you're curious about testing but are unsure how to proceed. I hope to give you some of the answers you seek. I should mention that I am not a scientist and I'm a librarian and a genealogist, so my understanding of the more complicated aspects of DNA inheritance is very basic um, and it relates to just genealogy on that side, not on the scientific side, but we're looking at demystifying it for you, so basic is likely a good place to start. Okay. So, I have mentioned that I am a genealogy local history librarian, and for the past number of years, I've I tested myself for DNA in 2016, but I've been tracing my family history for about 30 years. So this to me was a, another tool I could use to trace my family history. But for a lot of people, we're seeing lots of advertising on television and in the internet, advertising DNA testing and your ethnicity estimate and find out how Irish you are around, around um, St. Patrick's Day or, um, you know, finding traditions that might have been your ancestors traditions and learning where your people came from. This is a bit of a marketing tool on the part of the DNA testing companies. Um, and it's worked in that it's getting a lot of people to test who might not have been interested in it from a purely genealogical point of view or even a scientific point of view. Um, they're selling it as a find out about yourself through your DNA, um, find out where you come from, where your people came from. So it's a very much a marketing ploy in that way. Um, and you, I know a lot of people have tested because of this and then there's more people to test, uh, to compare testers to. And I'll get into a little bit of that, why that matters later on. So what can you learn from testing? Why do people want to test? Um, so confirm no known family connections. It might be that you think you're related to a certain branch of a family and you're not quite sure, um, or connecting with cousins and building community. So um, maybe family members have gotten lost to history. You know, people move to different countries, different places, and you've lost track of them. Um, it could also be finding um, lost family members or ones you never knew about due to either unknown parentage or uh, adoption, um, finding birth families. Um, people often want to test for health information, and that's another type of test that's advertised online um, and on the television as well. But I don't, well, I'm not really focusing too much on the health tests. I'll mention it briefly and what it sort of entails, but um, separate from ancestry testing, there is one company that does both, um, and I'll, I'll be talking about them a little later. And the number one thing that people tend to take the test for is their probable ancestry or, or, or ethnicity. Um, how Irish am I? How Scottish am I? How Jewish am I? How African American am I? Um, that kind of thing. Do I have Indigenous ancestry? These are the 
the things that people are testing for, mainly because that's what the advertising is sort of pushing to say, you know, find out about yourself. And they're not necessarily pushing the fact that there's certain information you can find out from these tests and information that you cannot. Um, so there's common misconceptions, um, mainly because it's a scientific test. People might not be aware of exactly what it entails, but also based on the marketing ploys of the companies themselves, wanting to get their product out there and increase the database of people who have tested. Um, the test, this is a common misconception. Uh, people that think that the test will replace traditional genealogical research, meaning um, if I take the test, it'll tell me exactly who my ancestors were, where they lived, where they worked, where they were born and died, how cousins are related to me, um, and what countries they came from. Now, um, or I know that uh, it, it can seem like an easy, you know, it's a collect your DNA, send it off to the company, and they tell you all about yourself and your ancestors. Uh, but it's not necessarily as easy as that. It can be quite easy for certain steps of it, especially if members of your distant family have tested. It will match you to them, but not telling you exactly how you are related to them unless you've done some kind of research in developing a little bit of a family tree on your own or a lot of a family tree on your own to make it easier to figure out how you're connected to these people. Ethnicity estimates can uh, reveal what country your people are from. Again, a misconception. Geopolitical borders um, are not known to DNA science. DNA science based on uh, what populations exist around the world and people have migrated for many, many millennia around the planet. So uh, trying to say I'm Irish or German or Indian is very difficult to do because those borders have changed and people have migrated and intermixed for many, many generations. So it's an estimate. And when we talk about estimates, I'll get into that a little later, but there's a uh, how they what they base that on and how they decide what uh, ethnicity you might have based on your submitted DNA sample. Um, another misconception, siblings inherit exactly the same DNA from parents. This is not necessarily the case. Um, even for identical twins, they said there's slight variation, um, but they're as close as you can get. If identical twins test, they will have most of the same, um, almost all of the same. But siblings inherit a, a slightly different mix from each parent. Uh, every time a child is conceived, there's a different portion of DNA from the mother and the father that go into making that child. And it might have been a different portion than three years before when another child was conceived or 10 years later when another child is conceived. Same genetic parents, different genetic information given to each child. Um, they will show as relatives, of course, if they both test, um, but they will not be exact matches. And for that reason as well, you might not match the same cousins genetically. You match them on paper and family relationships, but ancestry and genetic inheritance isn't necessarily an indicator of um, that you're in or out of a certain group. Um, and this is the final misconception I was mentioning. If you don't see a, a certain ethnicity that you expect to see, that that means you're not from that group, not necessarily. Um, because let's say your brother tests, in my case, my mother's French Canadian, and he, he has quite a bit of French Canadian in his ethnicity estimate. I have zero. We have the same parents. I didn't get that portion of my mother's DNA that she got from her father. Um, and that's just the way that works. Uh, but I'm still a member of that uh, inheritance. Uh, I just didn't get every portion from the parents. Because, And I'll get into the inheritance a little bit now. So what is DNA? If you get into, well, DNA, of course, is a short form for <laughs> deoxyribonucleic acid, which is why we say uh, DNA, because it's a lot easier to say. And I've got a little bit of a diagram here showing um, the uh, molecule that um, for the DNA and what it shows, the different portions of it. And there's different types of tests that, different, that test different portions of the molecule. Um, and in the molecule, it carries your genetic instructions that you got from your parents to tell you, you know, that tells uh, your system how tall you are, what color your hair is, what color your eyes are, um, certain things that you inherit, genetic, genetic conditions perhaps, and traits that pass down. Um, and these are inherited in different ways. And you inherit in different bits from each parent, as I mentioned before. 
Now, shared segments of DNA show a link to common ancestors. So if you have a portion of DNA that you share with a cousin, uh, that means you have a shared ancestor somewhere in your past. Uh, and depending on the type of test you've taken, the, the past, uh, the, the ancestor could be a couple generations ago or many, many generations ago, depending on the type of test that you've taken. And the more segments you share of shared DNA, and there's segments of DNA, um, that, uh, that means the closer related that you are to that cousin. Now, the cell itself, we talk about the, um, the molecule, and within the molecule, the inside circle there is called the mitochondria. And that's information that you carry, uh, you inherit solely from your mother, your mitochondrial DNA. And there are certain types of tests. There's one type of test that can test just the mitochondrial DNA that you and every child inherits from their mother. So tracing the mother's 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 line. And that's a very specific type of test. Um, and then there's the Y chromosome test. In the inner circle, you can see chromosomes um, that are 22 pairs of chromosomes. And the 23rd pair at the bottom is split into the sex chromosomes, either the X or the Y. Now the X is inherited from the mother and the Y from the father. Now the father can pass on either an X or a Y because a male child has X and Y DNA and a female child only has X and X. So the female child gets an X from her mother and an X from her father. The male child gets an X from the mother and a Y from the father. So the Y DNA flips. Um, if the male gives the Y DNA to a child, that makes it a male child. If he gives an X, it makes it a female child. And that's the, the gender uh, determination at the time of conception. Sorry, I shouldn't say gender, I should say sex. That's the sex of the child. There's a test you can do to test the Y DNA, and that's the father's 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 line. This is a test that only males can take. Uh, so if you're testing a brother, like if you're a female and you wanna test your father's line, you'd have to test a male relative, a brother, a paternal uncle, grandfather, or father that would tell you the the inheritance from the father's 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 line and both the mitochondrial that i mentioned earlier and the y dna are testing your more distant ancestor deep ancestry as they call it so your match you could match someone else who has a similar y dna and it could be a couple generations ago it could be a thousand years ago or multiple thousands of years ago so uh, these two tests have been on the market a lot longer than the more recent tests that have been advertised, which are the autosomal tests. Now the X, um, sorry, the Y and the mitochondrial tests have limited uh, usability for some of the relationships that people like to prove with DNA. Um, so it, it, they were, they've been around for over 10 years now, 15 or 20 years, I believe, but they've fine tuned the testing and built up larger databases of people who have tested. So this means that when you're testing, they're comparing you not to your direct ancestors because they're not getting your DNA. They're not getting the DNA from your direct ancestor. Those are people are long gone. So you can't test them. You're, you're comparing your results of your test to people who have tested with that testing company. It's called a reference population. So it means that if ancestry DNA or 23andMe DNA have a match for you, or multiple matches for you. Those people, unless they've tested with the other company, might not show up if you test with the other company. So you could have a perfect first cousin that you don't know about who's tested with a different company than you. And you'll never know that because you've tested with different companies who have different pools of people they're comparing you to. This also means you're gonna get different ethnicity estimates slightly because, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, and the caveat attached to um, ethnicity estimates. So the three types of DNA tests that um, I mentioned, the Y DNA, testing the father's 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 line, which is the, uh, the blue across the top, and uh, the mother's 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 line, the mitochondrial is the pink along the bottom. Everything else in the middle, and including all of these squares, is the autosomal DNA test for all of your ancestors. So it's possible for you to find um, a link of DNA that you share with a cousin that's living now that takes you back to an ancestor who isn't on either of the male or female lines. They're just um, somewhere within your genetic background. 
uh, and somewhere within your uh, genealogical background, so on your family tree. And this tests everyone. So it doesn't mean that you're going to inherit a piece of every single ancestor from way back because every time a child is conceived, they only get 50% of each parent and your mother only got 50% of each of her parents and so on and so on. So you only have to go back a few generations to make it so that you only have a very, very small portion that you may have inherited from your third times great grandmother. Did it trickle down to you? Did it trickle down to a cousin? Um, did it go to your father? Did it go to his brother? Did it go to neither of them? And then it didn't pass down to you because it wasn't in the mix that was passed to you when you were conceived. So the autosomal DNA is the one that's advertised the most. Um, and there's multiple companies that test for this. There's four main companies really that test for autosomal DNA and have large databases of people to compare you to. Um, and this autosomal DNA, as I mentioned, is inherited from both parents, and it was a game changer in the uh, DNA, consumer DNA testing uh, business because uh, more and more people, as of 2016, when I took the test, they had just started, I think, the year before to start bringing out these autosomal tests um, so that people could test and compare to other cousins on different lines of their family, not just the male or female lines of their families. Um, so for genealogists, which I'm part of, um, that was, like I say, a game changer. You could connect and prove relationships that you knew um, you had with certain relatives. Also, you could connect with new cousins and find information you never knew about that lost ancestor. In my case, I had a German great-great-grandmother, have not been able to find her for 30 years of researching. I found her where she came from through matching to a DNA cousin who was a third cousin of my, a fifth cousin of mine who connected back to that great grand, great great grandparent. So there are possibilities there, but the genealogy has to come hand in hand with the DNA testing. It's a tool that you can use, but it's not the only one that's available. Um, so the most recent and popular test, there's four main companies, which I'll touch on in a moment, um, and they all test every ancestral line. So you could have cousins from many different uh, of your surname lines if you're looking at your family. It's more accurate for recent generations and immediate family. So the closer they are to you, the more likely they're gonna match you on an autosomal test uh, as well. Uh, because it's more recent generations, that's when the records exist. Most uh, developed countries have records back a certain number of generations, maybe centuries, but there's a time when the paper record drops off and that's where DNA, the more recent, the more the distant DNA, I talked about the Y DNA and the mitochondrial DNA, that's the more deep ancestry back before recorded history. But this is sort of helping to confirm more recent connections and shared segments of DNA um, with, between people. And it can confirm up to about six generations back to a shared ancestor. Um, now that only, is if you've put up a tree online, I put a little note at the bottom, if both matches, you and a cousin that you match on your ancestry match list, if you both have created trees and made them available on that website, um, the system will say you're related because you share segments of DNA. But if you have both have trees posted and have common surnames, it will point out the, um, the shared ancestor if you have one listed. But it will not give you suggestions on an ancestor if you haven't created a tree. If all you've done is send in your test and it comes back with results, you're not going to get um, a detailed analysis of your ancestry from a person point of view, who came from what country and what time period. Now you might wonder, how do I test? Um, all of the, at least the four largest uh, consumer DNA tests for the autosomal DNA, which is the bulk of the testing that's out there. And the one I advise if you're just beginning is the one you should take. Um, you can order the test online. You provide saliva samples, so you, uh, or a cheek swab, depending on the company. I did one with Ancestry DNA. So you spit in a tube, um, you shake it up with a solution, you put it in, a, in the tube, uh, sorry, you put the tube in an envelope and you mail it back to the company. And it takes anywhere from three to eight to maybe 12 weeks, depending on, I guess, the number of people who are sending in tests because there's always big pushes around the holidays. So you'll see at Christmas time, you'll see lots of ads about Ancestry DNA and 23andMe DNA and Family Tree 
DNA. Um, and so they're, they'll get around Father's Day, Mother's Day. They're the great gift to give is what the advertising tells you. And in a way, it's good that more people are testing because there's a larger pool of people to compare you to. So when you test, there'll be more cousins to match you to and have more accurate um, ethnicity estimates for you. Now, while you're waiting for that result, because it can take weeks to come back, it's good to build a tree of the basics of what you know about your family. And uh, oftentimes people know some information about parents, grandparents. In the case of adoptees, they might know very little or nothing. Um, and so you're just waiting for matches to maybe uh, be able to tell you maybe where you might fit on the tree that they've created because they have uh, their ancestry traced. So um, DNA testing, as I mentioned, isn't a substitute for research. It is a tool to use to enhance the research. Um, but the advertising tends to tell you that it'll tell you everything up, up front. And even before DNA testing was a thing, you'd see uh, advertisements specifically for Ancestry.com around the holidays saying, you know, um, get a subscription and, and sign up and you'll just see your whole family tree posted right away. And that was always a bit of an annoyance to me because I traced my family history for many years. And there's a lot of legwork and, and research that goes into historical uh, discovery of information about ancestry. So um, it isn't as simple as just signing on, paying a subscription fee and having your tree created for you. That's not what the services do. They provide documents and other people's trees that you can look at to try to figure out what your ancestry is. Um, so there are tools there for a lot of the, the testing companies to build a free tree that you can then connect to your DNA results and match you up that way. So you need to do both, as I mentioned, um, to have a reasonable chance of success in um, figuring out what your ancestry might be related to your DNA. And sharing at least a small public tree can really, um, really improve your, your chances. And that could just be yourself and your parents and your grandparents if you know them. Um, something else to mention too, when you're building a tree, you can set privacy restrictions so only people, uh, any living people in your tree, yourself, parents or siblings, will be marked private and nobody can see what their names are or their details, but deceased individuals will show up uh, in a public search if you make the tree public. You can also post a private tree and only you can see it. But the disadvantage to doing this is if a DNA cousin sees you on their match list and they can't see how you're related, they have to then send you a message and then you communicate back and forth that way. Uh, it's always nice to make a public tree available to show at least who your ancestors are, and it will privatize the information for living individuals if you're concerned about privacy for that. Now, who do you test with? There are four major companies I mentioned, and there's a fifth just coming on the market, which is a bit uh, being a little bit um, slow to add new services, so I haven't really included it here. Ancestry DNA is the big, uh, the big one because they have the largest uh, database of people who have tested. It is in the, it might be close to 20 million people worldwide that have tested with Ancestry DNA. I know it's in the teens at the very least. Last time I checked, I think it was 15 million uh, a few months ago. And it, it amps up around the holidays too, so you'll see it increase. Um, they do only autosomal testing, and they um, they started out as business allowing you to build your family tree. So they've added DNA testing as an add-on to their uh, genealogical research arm. So it's a, an arm of theirs, which is the DNA testing. Now 23andMe is the other large one you can do and they do autosomal testing, but they also do health related DNA testing. And I'm not really getting into a lot of that, but you'll see a lot of um, other smaller testing companies that'll tell you, you know, uh, do you have genetic conditions? Will you likely get this form of cancer? Do you, um, you know, what have you inherited from your ancestors? Do you have any genetic anomalies, things like that? Um, sometimes they even say that they can predict certain traits that you might have. You know, are you good at uh, crossword puzzles or are you great at art or music, things like that. And sort of um, relating to your traits and what you've inherited, not necessarily um, who you get them from, but uh, what you've inherited. So, and DN but 23andMe as well has uh, the ability to, uh, you can build a tree as well on there, but they don't have any historical records that you can link up to. The advantage of DNA with Ancestry is that they have billions of historical records digitized and available online. You can access Ancestry records from the library for free, but if you're testing through the DNA arm, 
you cannot load up a tree through the free account, sorry, through the library account. The good thing is when you test with um, these companies, the ability to build a tree is free um, as part of that. They want your tree to be posted, but you will not be able to view the historical records available on the websites if you don't have an, a separate subscription, separate from the DNA test that you ordered. So you will always be able to build a free tree and link it with your DNA results, and that will always be freely available to you through your free account. Um, but if you wish to do more in-depth research and view other things they have available, you will have to pay extra for uh, a more detailed subscription. Now, family tree DNA is very similar to ancestry DNA in that they started off with, um, well, they have uh, a very, sorry, I should mention, my, my heritage DNA is the one I was going to do next. They started off with historical records being available, and then they added a DNA arm to that. So, and there, all the other three companies, the family tree DNA, ancestry, and 23andMe are American companies. Um, whereas my heritage DNA is European, it's based in Israel, so they have more European testers. So if you have European ancestry, my heritage DNA might be the best option for you. Um, although ancestry DNA, the other three tend to show because most people who test are North American, you're matching reference populations that are American and fewer in other parts of the world, but it's building as they're growing and expanding their companies to other places to have people test. Um, Family Tree DNA started off as just a DNA company, but you can build a tree there as well, but they don't have historical records available. They are a DNA testing company to start with, and much like 23andMe, um, and they, but they all will show you various similar things. For example, what can you expect from your results? Number one is an ethnicity estimate. This is a screen at the top from Ancestry. Uh, it's a pie chart. This is actually mine, um, showing that I have certain percentage Irish, certain percentage Scottish, and a little bit of other regions. Now, this has changed over time. As they, when I first tested in 2016, I had a lot of Scandinavian and a bit of Irish and a bit of uh, just Western European. But as they test more people, the reference populations, they're able to fine tune what their predictions are about your ethnicity. And it is a prediction or an estimate. So people say, well, my DNA doesn't change, right? So no, your DNA doesn't change, but the testing they use to interpret where your ethnicity is from, or what your ethnicity is rather, that changes over time. So every couple of months, there'll be an update because they have more people testing and they compare you not to your ancestors, but to living people who are from certain areas of the country. So I test and I match with 40, my, my DNA matches about 49% of people who live in Ireland today who, who have had Irish ancestry back a number of generations. The same with the uh, Scottish. And this is, was not a surprise to me, but my mother is half French Canadian, actually three quarters French Canadian. And none of that shows up on my particular ethnicity estimate. Shows up on my mother's and her father's who have both tested and my brothers both get a bit, but I did not. Doesn't mean I'm not French Canadian <laughs> uh, background. It just means it didn't show up in my in that trickle down of the DNA that I inherited. The other um, thing you'll see is DNA matches. All the testing companies show you this as well. This is the bread and butter I find of what the test is about: is who you match to because they share strands of DNA that were coming from your ancestors that you share with that person. And then they have various tools that might predict how you're related, but only if you've created a tree online. So Ancestry has one called Through Lines. At the bottom, um, this was family tree DNA. They have something that's just called matches. That is your DNA matches. It'll show you those people and how, they're, um, how much DNA they share with you. And they have different tools like browsing the chromosome, which section of the chromosome you get from a certain ancestor and what you share with that match. It gets a little bit more technical. I'm not going into that today. It's way too complicated. Um, and then it's something called My Origins, which is their ethnicity estimate tool. Um, now, in my case, across three companies, I had, these are, I didn't test with all three companies, but if you test with Ancestry, you can and with the other companies as well, you can download your results and load them up to the other websites, even if you haven't tested with them. Um, so you're able to take your Ancestry DNA test, which I did, and download your results, which is just a simple uh, text file, and you load it up into Family Tree DNA, which is the one in the middle, 
or uh, into my heritage, which is the one on the right. And so by testing with one company, I was able to expand it and test and uh, what they call fishing in, in other ponds uh, to see if I could find matches and, and in other places. But it gave me different ethnicity estimates. You can see the differences between Ireland, Scotland, and England and Wales. And over here, I've got West and Central Europe, British Isles, Scandinavia, and Iberia, a 19%, which might be that French Canadian bit uh, from the Iberian Peninsula and parts of France. Um, and then of course, the one on the right, uh, I've got some Scandinavian, Irish, Scots, Welsh, Iberian, and Italian. So you see there are some common things, but the percentages are all different. And why is that? They each use a different tool to test. They have different algorithms they use and different reference populations they're comparing you to. So uh, that is the very variable nature of predictions of ethnicity estimates. People tend to forget the fact that it's an estimate. And you'll see YouTube videos of people testing and saying, I got results back and it says I'm this percentage this and I can't believe it and where did this come from and oftentimes it's um, like for example if I looked at this one on the right and said I had a little bit of Italian it says 1.9 percent that is very 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 small and it's likely that people who live in Europe you know that they a lot of people move around over generations so there could be a little bit of Italian in there or it could be that French which borders Italy which I'm from so or my so to my ancestors are from so this is what people sell the test as but it's just sort of variable as what it's giving you now if this popped up that i had um 40 southeast asian that would be a surprise to me because it doesn't show up in my genealogical paper record so that would be something to investigate um, and that's where people get a little surprised when they see those results um, the estimates will often come with a map this is a, a friend of mine who tested and it shows you know, all the different regions that her family, um, what she inherited from them, um, all over Europe. Um, she's got from every every little part of Europe, it seems, she's got a little portion. So you can see how her ancestors likely came from so many different places and intermarried, and um, especially here in Canada too, um, for generations, you know, um, we're all kind of a mix of everything. So, what I find important to mention is that cousins are the key to this testing. You test maybe because of the ethnicity estimates, but cousins are the key. They match uh, you on certain segments of your DNA. That's a segment that you share with that person might take you back to a common ancestor. In this case, you know, it, Ancestry has predicted that these two people are related and because they both posted uh, family trees, it said that this is how they're connected through this couple here on the left. Um, so that's really helpful to, to know. So if you hadn't posted a tree, it would not show you that information. You might only think you'd only know a little bit about your family, but even just a little bit can help um, cousins decide or figure out how they're matched to you. And the higher their centimorgan level, which is a CM, the closer they are. That is the measurement of how much shared DNA you have. It will say in your results list um, that you share a certain amount. Let me bring it forward here. You share a certain amount of center morgans. For example, this is mine. My mother, I match, you know, uh, a large number, 3,400 center morgans. I share a lot with her. My brother's listed below. I share less than that. And then further down I go, my grandfather, my aunts, um, I share a little bit less because the further removed they are from me, the less DNA I share with them because they have other segments of their DNA that I didn't get portions of their family that I'm not related to in that way. I didn't get every bit. So just to go back to this, you may have researched, they may have researched their family. Maybe you haven't, but they have. So the cousins are the key to figuring out things about your ancestry if you want to connect with it, the DNA testing in that way. Um, and all websites give an option for, con for contacting matches. So even if they haven't posted a tree, you can say, well, it looks like we're second cousins, I can send a message and, and try to reach out and grab that. This is another example. If uh, this cousin of mine, uh, distant cousin, she matches me. It says here on 47 center Morgans at the bottom, that's me on the left and her on the right. It traces us back. You see how it says private above her? These are her parent, her parent and grand, her mother and grandmother who are listed as private. So I can't see those. She can't see mine either. But um, my mother, grandmother, great grandmother, all the way back to this person living in the uh, early 1800s, uh, this is our common ancestor. 
that Ancestry predicts because we both have a tree that has this person in it. Uh, and it's confirmed by the DNA that she shares with me. Um, so they all show various ways. This is another website showing DNA matches roughly how much uh, how many centimorgans they match on. Again, my mother and brothers are listed at the top and then it gets smaller the lower down you go, more distant cousins and they often list them ranked. So the closest matches will appear at the top and all the way down. Um, another, this is uh, my heritage website showing you exact, you know, samples you can see their tree you can review their match you can contact them directly um, and it tells you roughly how how they think you might be related now who do you test first if you're deciding to spend the money and they can go upwards of 100 to 200 dollars depending on the test or the time of year when they have sales on i usually buy ancestry tests when they're on sale for 69 dollars around the holidays so i buy a couple and then i bring them to family get-togethers and hand them out. <laughs> um, so testing the oldest living blood relatives is a priority. Before testing yourself even, if you've got elderly relatives, it's best to test them first because you never know how long they're going to be here. Um, I ended up testing myself first and then I tested my grandfather, my mother, my father's sisters because he's deceased. So I test my father's sisters because I need portions of his DNA. I'd like to test all of his siblings because they each inherit a different portion of my grandparents who are both deceased on that side of the family. Aunts and uncles are important, siblings, and then yourself. Now I find I, it was kind of a waste of money really to test. Um, if you have both parents alive and you're able to test both of them, you don't need to test yourself because you will not be related to anybody that they're not related to because you inherited portions from both of them. So um, something to consider. Um, and oftentimes, I think I've tested about a dozen different people on different branches of my family. My deceased grandmother's younger brother is still alive. I tested him um, matching to different branches of the family. Um, and even with my aunts, my father's sisters, they match to different cousins because they inherited different chunks from their each of their from their shared parents. So my father may have inherited that chunk or not, but my aunts did or didn't. And I'm able to connect with different cousins for that reason as well. So I often get the result of why did my brother have different results? Sorry, I get the question about this. So parents only pass down half of their uh, autosomal DNA, AT DNA to each child. And that's a random um, mix that was sent down. And that's a random mix from each grandparent. So this is kind of a nice visual of if you have the eight colors across the top, each of these is groups is one person. So these are grandparents, grandmother, grandfather, and each child that's born has a different mix of both of the parents. Um, and then you get down to the through the grandchildren, they are all related to the same parent and grandparents, but they each have different chunks of DNA from each of them in different quantities. So that's why you might say, well, why does my brother not match the same cousins? We're not related. That's not the case. If, if you share enough of those centimorgans I mentioned, you are, uh, you are siblings. So I talked about fishing in all the ponds. You are able to take your results from one company certain companies and transfer them into other ones. I always suggest testing with Ancestry first because you cannot test with another company and load your results into Ancestry. They have the largest pond, as I'm mentioning, the largest pool of people who've tested. So you need, I always test with Ancestry first and then you can test with the others if you choose to um, or pay a little bit to upload their, your results to their site. Um, this will allow you to, um, see matches in other uh, on the other testing companies because you might be missing a cousin that could be the key to unlocking a mystery in your family but a caveat to be ready for surprises um, testing may reveal previously unknown relationships a uncle cousin sibling parent you didn't know about um, people have tested and found out that they were adopted um, it also may disprove links you have to your family. You think you're related to one branch and you actually are not because there's a um, unknown paternal event somewhere in the past where the parent who was listed as the father was not officially, um, gen genetically, I should say. Um, and it can expose long held secrets, specifically around um, illegitimacy of children. 
um, and adoptions that weren't told about to the children. So don't test if you don't want to know, but be aware that the more people who test out there, if your first cousin has tested and your brother has tested, and you're, it's eventually secrets will be found out in some way or another if enough people are testing and finding out how you're related and how they're related. But I would advise if you don't want to know if there's a surprise in your family, it's best not to test because there are, it can be quite, um, quite emotionally, uh, just very emotionally damaging to uh, test and find out that you're not who you think you are. And that's how people present it. There's lots of people um, who've tested and post videos online and say, I'm not related to who I thought I was. And um, it causes a bit of a crisis of, con um, crisis of identity really for some people. And there's the one thing about solving cold cases. You may have heard that the DNA is DNA uh, ancestry tests are now being used by law enforcement to try to solve cold cases. And the way they do this is by using um, a, a website called GEDmatch where people can load their DNA results for free and um, then they can take un, um, unsolved mysteries and the DNA from those unsolved mysteries and load them up into the database and see if they can find cousins who match this unknown suspect and figure out the family tree and how they connect and solve. You may have heard of the Golden State Killer in California who was recently convicted of many, many murders and rapes in the 1970s. He just was convicted this year based on DNA ancestry tests and um, people who shared their results to, uh, to try to figure that out. So um, I'm hoping that some people have questions. Um, we have a few, about 20 minutes left. I kind of rushed through. It is sort of a, a whistle stop tour of uh, what's possible for DNA testing. Um, and I'm hoping that you might have some questions. Um, if you don't have any that you can think of right now, you can um, email me at the address on the screen or give me a call. I'll try to give you whatever direction uh, I'm able. Um, there are lots of resources online. Um, watch lots of videos on YouTube about DNA testing. There are tools you can use, websites where they provide help, um, Facebook groups where they discuss how to interpret your results. There's lots of different avenues for, um, for finding information. So uh, if anyone out there has a question, we can um, go from uh, there. I got a question in the box now. Am I making this available? Yes. Um, I'm recording it now and it'll be uh, posted to our YouTube channel uh, probably sometime next week uh, if you're looking for that. Uh, there are also a lot of videos on YouTube about this exact topic, which are likely more in depth than my own um, or are um, a little bit more in depth on certain sections and you can watch them in a series. Thank you, Joyce, for that comment. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It is a bit of a, a large topic to try to cover in a short period of time over lunch. Um, and uh, it's, it's something that's really exposed a lot of mystery for me and my family, um, specifically further back um, within about the second great grandparents uh, level where family stories could only take me so far and family records could only take me so far. So that one lone German great great grandmother, um, we'd always I'd known that she'd married my um, my Patterson uh, ancestor in Ohio, but that they, she was from Germany and he was from Scotland, and it turned out that um, I ended up matching and my aunts, my father's aunt, sisters, who had tests they matched to cousins who lived in Ohio, and I knew that that couple had been married in Ohio, and I thought, I wonder if she moved there from Germany to be with her family and then met this Scotsman and um, then ended up in Canada, and it turned out that there was a common ancestor, turned out her brother, my great-great-grandmother's brother, who was in Ohio, and his descendants matched us to a certain level to make us fourth cousins. Um, and fifth cousins. And so I was able to find her baptism record back in Germany because I now knew her parents' names. I know the village she was from. I know what ship she came over on because I was able to find her in records arriving in New York City at Ellis Island, actually before Ellis Island existed in the 1850s. So this tells you something that I could discover. DNA was the clue for me to look somewhere. I could have scoured records 
in Ohio, which I had been doing, but I was looking for the wrong name because the name was slightly misspelled as sometimes happens for our ancestors who came from other countries and uh, the name was slightly misspelled, the vowels were different and it went from being a Kenner, K-E-N-N-E-R, on her headstone and all, all records that I could find. It turned out her birth name was Kerner, K-I-R-N-E-R. -E and that was the family that was living in Ohio um, with various spellings of that name. But they all had roots in a village in Germany. Um, and it turned out that that family had a younger sister, which matched my great-great-grandmother's name and her birth year. Um, and we share DNA, which is the clincher to prove that not only do we match on paper now, we match via DNA. We share enough of DNA that it predicts that they're that close to me in, in, in um, genetic relationship. So there are mysteries possible there. Got a question here. Oh, talking about uh, upload your DNA results. Um, and people are seeing, sorry, the question is that she's seeing a lot of pop-up ads relating to upload your DNA results and um, find out if you're a Viking <laughs> and uh, what your ancient origins are. Okay, just asking, um, asking if that's, uh, are there any that aren't to be trusted? Yes, um, I would say that some of the smaller companies, the ones I haven't mentioned, like if you're looking at Ancestry DNA, My Heritage DNA, um, Family Tree DNA, and 23andMe, those are all reputable and they've been around quite some time. Um, and they've got established procedures and algorithms and privacy uh, uh, reg regulations regarding your testing. Um, smaller tests, I think it's sort of a jumping on the bandwagon. People said, oh, well, we, we're a lab, we could do DNA testing, and we'll, we'll, we'll say we can predict this or that. Um, it's, I would stay away from those. A newer one that's on the market is Living DNA, which is a UK company. And um, it's, I've, I've uploaded my results to them, as you can, um, not testing directly with them, but uploading my results to them and I've yet to get because they're still building their tools and things that you can match with they're not showing DNA matches very detailed yet and they don't have a large testing population yet so but loading up to GEDmatch um, you commented as well um, but you're wary of others yeah GEDmatch is a free site where you can upload and compare to people across platforms so if i've tested with ancestry and you've tested with family tree dna and someone else has tested with my heritage if we all download our results and put them on GEDmatch, that's where we can match up and figure out how we're related and GEDmatch is the site that the uh, law enforcement uses um, to try to solve unsolved cases um, and you can opt in to be included in law enforcement searches or you can opt out of that as well if you're not um, not comfortable with that let me see here there's another question oops sorry the question box just disappeared from my screen and then i lost it <laughs> okay No, I don't think there's a new question. I was just a follow up on, I think, Joyce's original question, sorry, Janet's original question um, about the different testing companies that are available. Do your research and maybe find, look online uh, to uh, read articles. People will compare the different tests and the benefits of each. Um, but the four big ones are good to start with because they'll be likely cheaper as well, uh, but also because they've, they sell more tests, they're able to offer a more reasonable price and they have more tools available to you. If they're just trying to sell you something like find out how Irish or Viking or whatever you are, and there's not a lot of other things behind that, you won't be able to take those results and upload them to an ancestry or um, ancestral uh, research site and be able to use those to match to people. Um, they're not, um, and it's not the same type of DNA test that you would take, for example, like law enforcement would use to just send it to a lab and determine if uh, a swab they took from a criminal was the same as something on a crime that is unsolved. Traditional DNA labs that they use for law enforcement and just generally um, 
are not the same as ancestral DNA tests. These are what they call direct to consumer ancestry, ancestry tests. So they're um, fine tuned for only the commercial use for the general public. Um, so that's the, that's the background there. Um, so if you're wanting to be able to eventually build up your family tree and work on that side of it and have ancestral um, and genetic matches to go with that, I'd advise testing with one of the big companies that I mentioned. I'll go back to that screen, um, which was way up here, I think. <laughs> These four companies, who to test with. Those ones are the more reputable ones for sure. I've tested with Ancestry myself, but I know people who've tested with all four of the other, through all three of the others, um, either tested directly with or uploaded their results to, and they all offer different portions, uh, different tools to be able to um, analyze your results. Um, thank you so much, John, for that um, comment about, uh, it was, <laughs> I hoped it was informative and I hope that you were able to take something away from it. Um, like I say, it is a large topic and it's uh, ever changing, really. I often get questions, people will call me and say, I used to be 50% Irish according to my test and now I'm 70% Irish, or this Scandinavian has dropped off completely. And I wondered about mine when I took the test and it said Scandinavia to begin with, like back in 2016. You've got to think about migration. The Vikings, the Scandinavians, they invaded a lot of different areas, specifically Great Britain. Um, and most of my ancestry is from Great Britain and Western Europe. The Vikings were all over that place, <laughs> all over those places. And, you know, uh, invading and settling and intermarrying and producing generations of children who now share that seg segment of DNA. So it didn't surprise me. Scottish specifically has quite a bit of Scandinavian mixing um, further back. Um, we're talking thousand, a couple thousand years ago. Uh, so that's why you might see different changes in the results there. Um, it can be a, a, a little disconcerting sometimes to see those results and people aren't quite sure. Yes, um, John says, you know, I wonder if DNA testing um, would tell you why you have a certain appearance. Um, I think certain tests uh, can, I know that GEDmatch, which is a place you can upload your results to for free, it has a couple of prediction tools like that it can predict your eye color and it, you know, try to say, you know, it tries to tell you this is what we think your eye color is based on the results that you gave us. Uh, I think 23andMe has health related, so it might talk about um, genetic inheritance and, and traits that you might have or um, conditions you might develop um, or, you know, getting into hair color, height and things like that. So the ancestry tests don't really get into that. So the, the three the ancestry, family tree, and my heritage don't get into that much at all. Although I think they're trying to dip their toe into the trait prediction um, as opposed to just strictly ancestral. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, there's so much out there. And there are books to be uh, read about this as well. They talk about it in the genealogy circles. There are genealogy specialists now. They call themselves genetic genealogists. And I'm getting to that point where whenever I'm doing um, a research project for myself or someone else, I say, have you tested your DNA? Because this might help to confirm what we're finding on paper. Because just because someone says they're your great, great grandfather on paper, did, did your great, great grandmother have another relationship and have a child by that other relationship? And it was never reported that way because why, why would it be? It was secret. Um, and th those things do happen um, more often than we like to think they happened. Um, so, uh, there, there are those things that could, that could come up in the DNA as a bit of an anomaly. Um, but these genetic genealogists are sort of on the hunt to help. Mainly, they've started out trying to help uh, adoptees and um, unknown parentage cases where they don't know who the father or, or mother might be because they were adopted, or it could be a, a donor-conceived uh, pregnancy, and they're trying to find birth parentage. So, uh, there are people out there who specialize in that kind of assistance for people to help you interpret your results. Um, got another question here. Does the kept testing company inform you of the uncertainty of the tests you take to check versus um, 
saliva, cheek versus saliva. Um, no, actually, well, the test itself, each, each test company decides which one. They all have, I think, um, the spit test is the ancestry one and my heritage, I believe. In family tree DNA, you swab your cheek for, for skin cells from your cheek. Um, and I think the uh, you can't opt to send a cheek swab to Ancestry. They send you a kit which has a tube in it that you have to put saliva into. Um, and they talk about, you're talking about the uncertainty. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, like saying, is it more accurate one versus the other? Um, no, it's your DNA is in your spit, it's in your saliva, it's in your, um, sorry, in your skin cells, it's in your hair, it's in your fingernails, uh, <laughs> it's in everything. So um, there's even been discussion about um, would it be possible, because we, I said we can't test our ancestors, right, because they're long dead, um, but they leave artifacts behind, perhaps a lock of hair that people used to like to collect, or stamps that they would have licked, or envelopes, um, or perhaps uh, an old hairbrush, or things like that that might contain traces of their genetic material. Is it possible to have those tested? There are companies coming on the market now that are getting into that, um, but it is very, very cost prohibitive right now. We're talking thousands of dollars just to get a single swab of hair tested to see, to get a genetic marker to be able to then use to, um, to compare to living individuals. So um, that's something to, to think about as well. Like, uh, wouldn't it be nice if I could, um, my father, for example, passed away 10 years ago, but I'm sure my mother has some things around the house that would have his genetic material on them perhaps. Um, and I, you wonder if we could test that and get more, or even my grandparents who have been dead now 20 years, or their parents, um, you know, short of <laughs> exhuming people and, 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 you know, doing that kind of thing, um, there, you can't get the, the test, um, the testing for, for deceased individuals. So testing the living is how you find out about the, about the deceased members of your family. Um, but that might change in time. Um, who knows? There's this famous case of, I talked about the mitochondrial DNA and the, the mother's 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 line. That famously was used to identify the remains of a body that's found a number of years ago under a car park in England. And it turned out that the body, they, they believed it was the body of Richard III, the King Richard III, who died at the Battle of Agincourt many, many, many <laughs> centuries ago. And it turns out they tri traced um, a living individual who descended from his sister, and it proved that it was the body of Richard III buried under the parking lot. So um, there are that, there is that to consider as well, um, that, you know, it is possible if they're trying, especially for unknown remains uh, uh, during and battlefields and things, there's whole projects trying to identify the remains of lost soldiers found unmarked graves and fields and, and all over the Western Front and in various parts of the, um, of, uh, the world where wars have taken place. Um, there's a question, do you know of family tree software to supplement, uh, the DNA testing you might do for record keeping purposes? Yes. That's a whole other presentation on researching your family and documenting, um, in a database. I personally use one called legacy family tree, which has a free version and a more advanced version with other tools. Uh, family tree maker is another one, um, which links up with ancestry. So you can sync the tree that you create on ancestry with the tree you have on your own personal computer at home. The advantage of that is if you're working on your stuff at home and you can upload it, you don't have to go for, to the website and up, update, upload in both places. Um, and uh, there's a number of other ones out there. Family Tree Maker, Legacy Family Tree, uh, Brothers Keeper is another one. Um, those ones are the major ones that you can use to organize your research. If you're just beginning, you can create a tree on Ancestry or on MyHeritage, but be aware that, of course, the tree is, is um, um, you can make it private, of course, but it's, if you attach any records to it, let's say you have a subscription to the, um, all the historical records with Ancestry and their DNA test, and you decide you don't want to pay the three or $400 a year for the Ancestry DNA subscription to all those historical records, any of those records that you linked to your tree on Ancestry will not be accessible to you until you renew your subscription. So you can create your tree and it will always be there, but historical records that you're keeping to back up your research, 
um, and the things you're claiming in your tree will not be there um, or not be accessible. So I like to, every time I find a historical record, put it on my own personal computer and document it in my own family tree software. Mine is called family, a legacy family tree, um, which is what I use. So that's just for record keeping purposes, a whole other presentation I could do. A, I used to teach a six week course on how to start your family tree and, and how to document. Um, so there's lots of things online you can look into on that. Uh, one of the best products to use. If you're just starting out, I would advise um, Family Tree Maker because it links with Ancestry DNA. Uh, I use Legacy Family Tree, which links up with um, Family Search, which is a free site where you can build your tree. But that's a place where you share the family tree. So if I upload my tree, it's uploading the individual's information, but other people can edit that because they're trying to create a world family tree and only have people entered once into the tree, not multiple times by every one of their descendants. So it's, it's a sort of a shared collaborative project. Um, something to consider there. Okay, so, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, just to finish off then. Um, Thank you for joining us today. I invite you to ensure that you have every Friday um, at noon blocked off in your calendar until May 21st for the Culture Chats at Lunch series. Next up on April 8th will be War in the Kitchen. In 2019, Parkwood launched a new historic food waste program experimenting with the six years of World War II food practices using the advice of the Toronto Star food columnist of the time, Marie Holmes. Interpreting Marie's suggested menus and recipes, Parkwood is currently focused in April 1941, creating and testing the recipes in real time, plus 80 years. This immersive culinary experience captures the imaginations and heritage enthusiasm of the Parkwood volunteers and the general public, recently being broadcast nationally by the CBC Sunday Magazine with Pia Chattopadhyay. In this exploration of our shared experiences with food and historic food ways, join Parkwood's curator, Samantha George, as she describes the project and the pivots due to COVID, working with rations and the food practices of 80 years ago. Please visit the RMG website, Robert McLaughlin Gallery, to follow the Culture Chats link for the link to join the program on April 8th. No registration is required. I wish you all a wonderful weekend and take care.